जय जय श्री चैतन्य जय नित्यानंद जय द्वैत चंद्र जय गौर भक्त वृंद जय जय श्री चैतन्य जय नित्यानंद जय द्वैत चंद्र जय गौर भक्त वृंद जय जय श्री चैतन्य जय नित्यानंद जय द्वैत चंद्र जय गौर भक्त वृंद नाना मत ग्रहग्रस्ता दक्षिणात्यजन दिपान कृपारीणा विमुच्चता गौरश्चक्रे स वैष्णवान्नामतग्राहग्रस्ता दाक्षिणात्यजन दिपान कृपारीणा विमुच्चता गौरश्चक्रे स वैष्णवान् नानामत ग्राहग्रस्ता दाक्षिणात्यजन दिपान कृपारीणा विमुच्चता गौरश्चक्रे स वैष्णवान् philosophies graha like crocodiles grastan captured dakshinatya jana the inhabitants of south india dwipan like elephants krupa arina by his disk of mercy विमुच्च लिबरेटिंग एतान ऑल दीज गौर 
श्री चैतन्य महाप्रभु चक्रे कन्वर्टेड सह ही वैष्णवान टू द वैष्णव कल्ट ट्रांसलेशन पर पोर्ड बाय हिज डिवाइन ग्रेस इसी भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी श्री प्रभुपाद translation lord shri chaitanya mahaprabhu converted the inhabitants of south india these people were as strong as elephants but they were in the clutches of the crocodiles of various philosophies such as the buddhist jain and mayavadi philosophies with his disk of mercy the lord delivered them all by converting them into vaishnavas devotees of the lord shri chaitanya mahaprabhu's converting the people of south india into vaishnavas is compared here in to lord vishnu's delivering gajendra the elephant from the attack of a crocodile When Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu visited southern India, almost all the residents were within the jaws of the crocodiles of Buddhist, Jain, and Mayavad philosophies. Here, Kaviraj Goswami states that although these people were as strong as elephants, they were almost in the clutches of death because they were being attacked by the crocodiles of various philosophies. However, just as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, in the form of Vishnu, saved the elephant Gajendra from the clutches of a crocodile. so he saved all the people of south india from the clutches of various philosophies by converting them into vaishnavas om agyana timirandhasya gyananjana shalakaya chakshurun militam yena tasmay shri gurave namaha nama om vishnu padaya krishna prasthaya bhutale श्रीमते भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी इति नामिने नमस्ते सारस्वती देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चात्य देशतारिणे वाचाकल्पतरूभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पतिता पावनेभ्य वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधार श्रीवासादि गौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 रामा हरे रामा राम रामा हरे 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 कृष्णा आई एम ग्रेटफुल टू बी हियर all of you at the lotus feet of their lordships and uh, try to speak something today on the topic of the the way in which krishna's kaviraj goswami reveals the glory of chaitanya mahaprabhu in this section it's in terms of his outreach so how krishna's kaviraj goswami has structured the the chaitanya charitamrit to reveal mahaprabhu's glories mahaprabhu's glorious outreach specifically so that will be the broad topic i'll discuss so this verse specifically saying it this is a prelude to the description of how mahaprabhu will travel extensively in south india and deliver people so i'll use the the tablet as a whiteboard to write certain things so here if you consider the chaitan charitamrit uh doesn't even know how many sections it has three sections now if we consider the we are in right on the section this is the adi now adi has 1 to 90 in chapters madhya has so it's 1 to 25 chapters and the antya has 20 chapters so is it 19 or 17 the first anyway whatever it is sorry about that but let's focus on the madhya that's our focus right now so now here what is happening essentially is we are in the at the transition of the 8th and the 9th chapter if we look at the overall book it's a very intriguing picture see chapters 1 to 4 i could say till 5 is mahaprabhu's travel from bengal specifically he took sanyas in bengal and from bengal to odisha he specifically came to puri 
that is his travel that is described then sixth chapter is his discussion with sarvabhoum bhattacharya it's a long discussion and then after that we will see that immediately he leaves he leaves immediately on traveling and in fact we'll see later on in the 10th 11th chapters when he comes back at that time sarvabhoum bhattacharya introduces mahaprabhu or introduces to mahaprabhu various prominent residents of puri so it's it's interesting that like mahaprabhu has attained an extraordinary success sarvam bhattacharya is the is the leading scholar of a whole branch of philosophy navanyaya and then he is also the main advisor of the king over there so mahaprabhu has transformed him but mahaprabhu does not rest on his laurels like he does that and immediately departs so he at least soon after taking sanyas he is in a very exuberant mood so he wants to keep traveling and we will see mahaprabhu has if you consider his travels there are two main travels he has which are the two main travels yeah so south and north and it's interesting that for him his travels to the north actually take more time in the sense that not that it is a longer duration the exact duration of each tour is not like nine terms of days it's not specified so clearly in chaitanya charitamrit but the idea is mahaprabhu's associates are afraid for him to go to vrindavan why because vrindavan if he goes yad gatva nani vartante he is so much in love with vrindavan he may never come back in fact that was also one of the apprehensions of his mother like externally mother said that she mata said if you go to rindavan it's so far away i'll not get any news but another was if he goes to rindavan he may just lose himself completely over there hmm. so sometimes devotees on their t-shirt or something they put i lost my heart in rindavan <laughs> you know well if you lost your heart you gained something wonderful hmm. but maybe we don't want to you to lose your heart so early you know there is so much service to it in all over the world shri prabhupad was in rindavan prabhupad left rindavan to go all over the world in fact we can say that's external vision prabhupad didn't leave rindavan prabhupad carried rindavan with him wherever he went and he manifested rindavan over there but the point is that initially he is eager to travel and even before many of his associates have assembled there he just leaves for south india and then later he comes back and when he has to go to north india he has to repeatedly request his associates and associates come up with excuses oh this festival is here go after this festival and then that festival is there and go after that festival so it takes a lot of effort to for mahaprabhu to actually go to north india and specifically to rindavan but south india he leaves immediately and so his south india tour is basically described from if we consider 7 8 9 10 and approximately 11 he is fully back 10 is more or less like his return and in this his travels are described in travels are described in chapter 7 and also in chapter 9 these are two chapters and in between here is the meeting with whom is that meeting ramanand rai and that's a elaborate meeting so the way Krishnadas Kaviraj Goswami has structured the Chaitanya Charita Amrit is significantly different from all the other biographies of Mahaprabhu. If we consider um, Mahaprabhu biographies, they broadly fall in two genres. Hmm. So generally, when we talk about a biography, biography is a book which describes the life of a person. Hmm. So normally. most such books are narratives they are narrative in their nature okay this happened and this happened this happened they focus on incidents hmm. and this is what chaitanya bhagavat is chaitanya mangal is and most of the biographies when mahaprabhu departed he was such a celebrity that at that time writing books was not easy now anybody can just type on a computer and publish with kindle at that time writing was very laborious Hmm? of course writing requires effort at many time but that time is very laborious but 27 biographies of mahaprabhu were written and that gives us some idea of the impact 
that he had. It is a colossal impact. And in general, one of the reasons why a biography is written is that the author cannot tolerate the thought that the memory of the deceased person will become deceased with that person. So I want the memory to live on. And that's why they write biography. So we can see that Mahaprabhu had such an impact. Now among those, nine are presently available. And three are what are primarily emphasized. So Chetan Charitamrut is the third. And in fact, among all the biographies that were written, this biography was the last. And after this biography, actually, no more biographies were written. So Chetan Charitamrut was the last biography. And in this, actually, the focus is not so much on narration as on analysis. Or it's more of a it's more of a book of theology in the mode of a biography. That's why what we what Maha, what Krishna Goswami Goswami does is that he's describing incidents, incidents, and when there are significant discussions, then those chapters become extremely long. Extremely long. So, if you will see all the longest chapters, now some of the chapters which are narrate, which are incidents are also long, but there are many incidents described. But the longest chapters are the sixth chapter, the eighth chapter in Madhya Leela, and these two are elaborate conversations, Sarumbhattacharya conversation, then Ramanand Rai conversation. And then after that, if we'll go towards the end of this, we'll have the 19th, 20th, 21st till 25. All of these are more or less teachings. They're instructions to group and so this is with Sarumbhattacharya, this is with Ramanand Rai, and these are with, these are again in Madhya, these are with Rupa Goswami and Sanatan Goswami. So what is he doing over here? He is telling that what is his purpose. So what, uh, what Krishna Askar Goswami did was, he, for him, the biography was not just a means to tell the life story of Mahaprabhu. The biography was also a means to consolidate his life teachings. Because among various spiritual teachers, at least in the medieval history, Mahaprabhu is among the few or the rare who didn't himself write extensively his will. So what were his teachings? So that was consolidated by Krishna Das Kiviraj Goswami. So in one sense what happened was, after Mahaprabhu departed, his legacy, the legacy of Mahaprabhu was there primarily in three places. One was Vrindavan and the other was Bengal. The third was Orissa. And here, the legacy in each of these places was kept in significantly different ways. That in Bengal, it was mostly his childhood pastimes, his youth pastimes, it is mostly his Leela. Hmm? And it is more, more his early Leela. And here it was more of his later Leela. And that stayed in the collective memory. So all the biographies that have been written, have been written mostly by devotees in Bengal, not so much by devotees in Odisha. And then the devotees in Vrindavan, what happened was for all of them, they, they were mainly the Goswamis. And Mahaprabhu appeared in Bengal, and most of his followers initially were from Bengal. But when they went to Vrindavan, they didn't focus on writing in Bengali, because not many people knew Bengali over there. So all of this was written in Bengali or Odisha, Odia, mostly Bengali. He said that actually what happened soon after Mahaprabhu departed, Pratap Rudra also lost the will to live and he also departed. And then the legacy that was prominent in, uh, in Puri shifted more to Bengal and then it continued on. So in Vrindavan, because it was a place of Sanskritized learning, the focus was more on writing in Sanskrit and the focus was also more on writing not Leela but Tattva. Because when Mahaprabhu came to Vrindavan, it was a sensation. But he was there just for two months and he left after that. So when the Goswamis were writing, they were writing for the, uh, the influential intellectual circles on those places. So they all acknowledge 
द ग्लोरी ऑफ महाप्रभु एज देयर टीचर एज देयर लॉर्ड बट बियॉन्ड दैट दे डोंट फोकस ऑन महाप्रभु सो दे आर नॉट राइटिंग द बायोग्राफीज ऑफ महाप्रभु दे आर राइटिंग द टीचिंग्स ऑफ महाप्रभु so they are writing center more on krishna they are describing in vrindavan so describe krishna leela they describe the Gau- the philosophy of gaura shiksha the shat sandarbhas and books like that bhakti rasamrit sindhu all of them are written so now what happened was krishna kaviraj goswami is in slightly older generation when he comes he actually was born in bengal and then he went to vrindavan and then when he wrote chaitanya charitamrit that is the first biography which is a combination of leela and tattva so the leela he had heard from his childhood the tattva he learned when he went to vrindavan on the instruction of tyanand prabhu and learned from the goswamis and there when he wrote the book he describes the past times but some of the past times are described more in detail in chaitanya bhagavat and krishna kaviraj goswami does not repeat those past times too much it's beautiful whatever past times are described but his focus clearly is on the tattva and that is what he primarily uh, primarily elaborates in general we can understand the focus of an author by evaluating uh, what is what are they spending time on how much text is devoted to what so maha so chaitanya charitamrit systematized chaitanya mahaprabhu's teachings in the form of a biography so now what happened was because it's a biography it is relatively easy to read and those who want philosophy they can go deep into the philosophy those who don't want they will just read the past times hmm? but the philosophy is very much there within it and prominently there and this this integration the way he has done it also reveals what how mahaprabhu is present so this is the overall structure and that's why when you see over here the time when he is writing he he is the other biographies don't have so many sanskrit verses that are composed chaitanya bhagavat and chaitanya mangal they may sometimes quote sanskrit verses as a part of their description of the activities of mahaprabhu so somebody quoted this verse or this verse is appropriate over here but krishnadas kaviraj goswami quotes extensively from the bhagavatam so that is sanskrit verses but also he composes original sanskrit verses especially at the start of each chapter which summarizes that chapter so basically he uh, mrs anshila prabhupad also follows in that that itself from krishnadas kaviraj goswami to shila prabhupad actually this became like a tradition so the tradition is sanskrit in bengali so prabhupad for example composes the markine bhagavat dharma that's a song which he composed when he uh, is on the verge of entering america beholding the coastline uh, of america and that time we see that there are bengali verses but in between there are sanskrit verses so it's a song but within the song he is quoting sanskrit scripture so that seamless transition between sang sanskrit and bengali that is pioneered by krishnadas kaviraj goswami and the reason one reason contextually is that he brought together the sanskrit teachings of tattva and the bengali description of the past times together in one magnum opus and this became such an authoritative book that afterwards nobody felt any need to write any more biographies of mahabharata in fact it became like the base book on which the gaudiya vaishnava tradition would elaborate its teachings so that's the, that's that's what krishnadas kaviraj goswami is going so we will see the previous chapter was extremely long the, the narrative past times are the narrative chapters chapters which narrate past times are generally not that long he describes the incidents briefly and this also re- reflects another point so i'll make three point the first was the structure of achetan charitamrit the combination of tattva and leela second is this reveals the as two aspects of outreach hmm? two forms of outreach generally we use the word class and mass that's something similar over here so mahaprabhu's class outreach and his mass outreach so his class outreach is to to intellectuals to the leaders of society 
and at that time because although there was a political rule in india of islam there there was within the broad vedic society hindu society the the brahmins still had significant influence they were the intellectual leaders and mahaprabhu interacted with them and how he transformed them so here we will see in his mass outreach when he is doing that it is just describe how he chants and dances and sings and the result of that is people are just uh, transformed magically transformed hmm. and then he is spending a lot of time so for example it's arun bhattacharya he spends day upon day and it's not that so much he is talking as he is hearing and then appropriately he speaks with raman rai also it is he is not speaking he is hearing he is directing the conversation through his questions but he is not speaking primarily he is having those discussions and we will see that if you consider the legacy of mahaprabhu mahaprabhu went to north india he went to south india and when he went there was an enormous impact however after he went and he left again bhakti sansu thakur in when he went to south india he said that mahaprabhu had brought south india to gaudiya vaishnavism but now again south india has has relapsed into its previous ways so the sustained uh, legacy so the the sustained legacy happened where mahaprabhu actually did class outreach and it was his followers so ramanand rai whom he met now he will renounce the world and uh, not exactly renounce the world is still a grahastha but he renounces his worldly position in the political world and he comes to be with mahaprabhu in puri so that legacy primarily happens through his class outreach hmm? the goswamis they write books they systematize the gaudiya siddhanta and then they carry it on so that is the way mahaprabhu does a class outreach and shila prabhupad also wanted this he wanted this in the terms that wherever he would travel initially he would meet people and he would give classes and he would do kirtans but in the later years as our movement started become more influential prabhupad looked forward to meeting influential people wherever he would go the leaders of society in we have prabhupad's conversations with some prominent thinkers and prabhupad loved these kind of discussions he also wanted this to be a significant part of the outreach so we will talk about so this so the previous chapter described mahaprabhu's class outreach and now it says mass outreach going to be described in this chapter and here a metaphor is used see the generally the purpose of a metaphor whenever we use a metaphor a metaphor basically is a comp- comparing something which we want to tell with something else so the purpose of a metaphor is essentially to link the unfamiliar with the familiar hmm? so you want to link the unfamiliar with the familiar so generally the concept may be unfamiliar the concept is unfamiliar but the met- metaphor the analogy that the compared object we can see so the compared object is familiar and that way the metaphor makes the concept accessible so generally what metaphors are used also conveys the target audience say if somebody is giving a spiritual talk and if you hear them say give me examples from say bollywood or hollywood or cricket or tennis or this they will be wonder okay what kind of audience this is probably not a temple hall audience that they are speaking to is it it so so or if somebody starts using uh, quite scientific metaphors oh really okay or some medical metaphors so the kind the metaphors they reveal the kind of audience that is being addressed in the past generally books were written by scholars for scholars books the spiritual wisdom generally was passed primarily through the oral tradition because there would be there would be wise people in most places and they would speak 
books were not so easily available. So books were written by scholars for scholars. And we see the fact that the metaphor that he's using, it's indicating that he expects his audience to be already familiar with the Bhagavatam. So the, at first glance, though you say, okay, Buddhist philosophy, Jain philosophy, these are known to be non-violent philosophies. And then why are they being compared to a crocodile over here? <laughs> <laughs> you know, generally a crook, well, different animals are, uh, are, are said to symbolize different things. You know, generally if we say in any culture, you know, he, he is like a crocodile. That's not a very complimentary thing to say, isn't it? <laughs> it can be, uh, it can be, it conveys strength, but it, can, it also conveys fear. It also conveys a certain level of uh, danger, harshness. So the idea is that the point is not so much to demonize the philosophy. The point is to compare. So just as Gajendra was trapped. So just as Gajendra was trapped. Gajendra was powerful like a crocodile, but he was trapped. And similarly, what happened was that here it is said these people were strong, but they were trapped. They were trapped. Now, what does the strength refer to here? Actually, in India, especially in the southern part, the spiritual culture was largely preserved. So, if you see, when India had like almost a thousand years of Islamic invasion, and there was a lot of devastation in North India. And the North Indian culture that is there right now in India, that is quite syncretic. You know, it's a combination of the traditional Vedic culture and the culture that came from, from the various Islamic invaders. There were not just one, there were many who invaded different times. South India was relatively unaffected. Although there were some invasions, but they were, they were it was never really, the whole part was not really conquered and dominated. Some part was, but not as much. The devastation was not that much, that frequently. So, the overall spiritual culture was quite strong. And in that sense, when we talk about Bauddha, Jaina, Mayavadi, none of these are materialistic philosophies. We could say they are, non, they are not exactly devotional philosophies. They are... Uh, both the Buddhism and Jainism, they are more non-theistic. They are not so much atheistic as non-theistic. Although there are some expressions which did become no, uh, become atheistic eventually. But they just didn't focus on God so much. Mm -hmm. And from our, some became atheistic. But from our tradition's perspective, they are actually pre-theistic. That means they laid the ground for eventually theism and eventually bhakti to be presented once again. So there are various reasons and there are various ways Mahaprabhu's strategy is affected. So I'll focus on the class outreach but just let me complete this part about this metaphor. So what is being talked about over here is that people were, people were attacked by these philosophies. And both the Jaina, Mayavadi, Kutarka, Khandana. So it is in the Bhakti Thakur has composed 108 names of Mahaprabhu. In one of them, he described that this is, these were the same thing. These three philosophies, they were what Mahaprabhu he refuted. He, re, he freed people from these philosophies. Now, as I said, all these three philosophies, they are, we could say, nowadays people have the spiritual but not religious. So these were, you could say these were spiritual, but not theistic. Hmm? Not exactly theistic. So the spiritual means that they were focusing on something higher. They are focusing on some higher reality, some conception of liberation, some con con conception of nirvana, some conception of uh, some higher attainment beyond the material. So they are spiritual in the sense that they were non-materialistic. Hmm? But they were not focused on God. So it's an interesting combination and so for people who are relatively speaking Sattva Guna, those who have living relatively a pious culture, so philosophies that are Rajasik or Tamasik, they are not going to attract people so much. 
Now, I'm here talking in terms of the overall impact because in every philosophy, there will be practitioners of various kinds. But these all focus on some level of higher consciousness. But what happens sometimes is, especially the emphasis of Chaitanya Charita Amrut is, and generally of the Gaudiya tradition, is something quite specific. You know, we have Sattva, Goodness, Rajas, Tamas. And then above this, we have Shuddha Sattva. Now, the, the, this, this idea that there is transcendental beyond the goodness, that is there in the Vedic script, various, various texts, but is emphasized in the, especially in the Bhagavatam, the term Shuddha Sattva. So what happens is, most of the focus of the Gaudiya tradition has been on raising people from Sattva to Shuddha Sattva. And that is why, if you read Chaitanya Charita Amrut or Chaitanya Mangal, when it's described that, oh, the society was so degraded. Now, what is their idea of society being degraded? They're saying that, oh, people would bathe in the Ganga, but they would chant the holy names only at the time of the eclipses. Or they would speak the Bhagavatam, they would speak on the Bhagavatam, but there would be no mention of Bhakti. Now, in today's world, we say, is that degraded? <laughs> well, if somebody is bathing in the Ganga, somebody is actually reciting Bhagavatam, well, that's quite elevated, <laughs> isn't it? But the point is that from the perspective of Chaitanya Charita Amrit, Sattva is often the greatest competitor to Shuddha Sattva. Hmm? And therefore, Sattva, anything that is in somewhat in Sattva also, is an entrapment. So Buddhism, Jainism and Mayavad, we could say that in terms of their philosophical implications, that the idea there is no ultimate reality at all, that could be somebody could say that's tamasic. But in terms of their lifestyle that they recommended, that was relatively sattvic. Some amount of regulations, some amount of higher pursuits. So sattva in one sense can be good for somebody who is in rajas, tamas and rajas. We bring them to sattva, that is good. They'll be able to rise to shuddha sattva. But our tradition's focus, at least at that time, has been on raising people from sattva to shuddha sattva. And thus, when it is said that there is a crocodile, the point is not to demonize the philosophy. The point is to recognize that sattva can also become a trap. And if somebody is trapped by sattva, they cannot rise to shuddha sattva. So what Mahaprabhu did was, he is compared that his instructions, his example, his very presence, all of those acted like the Sudarshan Chakra. And what was holding people down at Sattva, it was cut off and they all rose towards Shuddha Sattva. That's what is described in this particular metaphor. Now, uh, how does Mahaprabhu go about doing the, uh, the class outreach? So I'll talk about three things and I'll conclude with that. So it is A-R-T. See, the first thing is, is that there has to be a significant difference between the way mass outreach is done and class outreach is done. Generally, with mass outreach, what happens is, say, this is the authority, this is the teaching figure, and this is the subordinate. So it's quite hierarchical. So Mahaprabhu would tell people to chant, and they would just be so inspired and they would chant. But then, that's with respect to the mass outreach. But with respect to class, what happens is, when Mahaprabhu is chanting, now if he will tell Sarom Bhatta, he will tell Prakashanan Sarita to chant. Prakashanan Sarita is not going to chant. He, in fact, he is going to say, you chanters, you are simply sentimental people. You know, it's not that I will chant, rather you should stop chanting and do what I am doing. So, he says, you should stop being sentimental and you should start, start discussing Vedanta with me. So what happens is, in one sense, when, when we are doing mass outreach, sorry, class outreach, so what happens? Now, we as, we may be authority in a particular field. And say we could be in, in the field of spirituality or bhakti or whatever, we are authority. But when we are doing class outreach, then others are also authorities in their particular field, whatever their field may be. Their field may be math, sorry, their field may be science, their field, field may be some management, their field may be philosophy. So in this case, we cannot speak down to them. We, 
it is more of a discussion rather than a discourse hmm? and that is a very different dynamic so shila prabhupad when he had uh, started his bhaktivan institute he um, wrote a letter to the devotees about how they should do outreach and he says three things so this this acronym art which i took was prabhupad says that we should learn the art of how to approach these influential people i'm paraphrasing the quote now that he says he says they will be proud but that's all right they have earned it it's very striking he said it's all right they have earned it that means if they have attained some success in their particular field that they will be proud that's okay they are at a high level so he says so the first so he says is we have to learn the art not that we have to teach them we have to learn the art of how to connect with them how to communicate with them and then he says we need to appreciate different points of view not that okay this is right and this is wrong you know okay they are coming from a particular perspective this we need to learn to appreciate different points of view so they from their experience so appreciate the viewpoint this appreciate doesn't mean agree there's a different point appreciating is yeah okay i understand where you are coming from and based on your your perspective your life experience your analysis yeah it's not a it's not a unreasonable conclusion just because it is not unreasonable doesn't mean that it is not incorrect it may be incorrect but we appreciate different perspectives and then second is respect respect their achievement respect their position we see this in mahaprabhu's dealings i don't have time to go into this elaborately but uh, we see this in mahaprabhu's dealings with sarom bhattacharya even with prakash anand saraswati with sarom bhattacharya mahaprabhu treats him like a father and a teacher in fact his disciples are upset why are you doing like this but why is he treating like a ordinary person mahaprabhu says no he is my well wisher mahaprabhu hears from him and the third is time we need to give them time to arrive at their understanding so sometimes okay i told you this why don't you understand this why don't you accept it no it doesn't work like that people need to figure things out okay what is going on over here yeah i heard this and i heard this and i heard this it takes time so if we have this mood of wanting to immediately convert that doesn't work it's not that we give one talk and yes sarva dharma an prithyajya i forget everything else and surrender that doesn't happen people they have their own conceptions we may say they are misconceptions but they have their conceptions and they have to deal with it okay this is what i have learned till now and this is what i am learning now and how does all this fit together so it takes time but if we go through this we as a movement have been successful to a large extent in direct outreach to the masses of course there is a lot more to do in every area but where actually if we want to reach influential people then we need to uh, re uh, we could say redefine or at least reorient the way we present and we will see that mahaprabhu himself has provided the example so appreciating others points of view so when he what is appreciation just in the past in the sarom bhattacharya says yeah i can understand where he's coming from it might seem a little presumptuous that a grahastha wants to instruct a sanyasi but it's not he says actually he is my well wisher he sees that i am a young sanyasi and therefore to protect me he is speaking the philosophy and then he sits down and he has respect he constantly even his, as, as i said his disciples his followers are annoyed but mahaprabhu says don't be annoyed with him don't speak like this about him and then time it goes on for seven days he just hears now we could say it is those seven days would have been intellectual torture he said just hearing philosophy see there are three things sometimes when we don't understand something we get bored hmm? and that's that's bad enough hmm? we get bored we get exhausted hmm? generally as a speaker you can understand when people are not connecting is when people start looking at you as if they are watching a foreign language movie without subtitles <laughs> so one is that we don't understand then it's 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 annoying hmm? it's okay but other is that second level is that we 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 understand that this person is speaking something wrong 
but we can't figure out what exactly is wrong and how exactly to point out it is wrong. Sometimes some speakers make some point which makes us uncomfortable. But, you know, what exactly is wrong? How to point it out? So we are uncomfortable. Third is, where we know what the speaker is speaking is wrong and we know how it is wrong, how to explain it. And at that time to maintain restraint is actually extremely difficult. You know, you are wrong, I immediately will point it out. So the time means Mahaprabhu exhibits this restraint. That he knows what he's speaking is wrong, he knows how to point it out, but he waits, he bides his time. And that's how he's able to eventually, when he respects Sarvabhama, Sarvabhama respects him. And then when Sarvabhama speak, Mahaprabhu speaks, Sarvabhama listens to him. And thus he's able to transform. So this is how we also can, especially as our as we want as our movement is spreading. You know, more and more, we need to reach out to people who are leaders or who are potential leaders if we have to spread in a sustainable and a extensive way. So there are some pointers from Mahaprabhu's example as depicted by Krishnadas Kiviraj Goswami. So I'll summarize. I spoke three main points. The first point was the structure of Chaitanya Charitamrita, how it is a combination of Tattva, that is from the Goswamis in Vrindavan in Sanskrit, and Leela, that is from the Bengali Vaishnavas in Bengali. So it's, it's, it's the last biography and it is more a book of theology in the mode of a biography. And the second point was about Mahaprabhu's outreach. How? He did both class plus mass outreach. And both are being described in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. So he, it is that when he is doing class outreach, He's actually sp that spending time, and that is, and Krishna Daska also, Krishna Daska Goswami also spends time in describing this. So, what Krishna Daska Goswami is doing, so that is indicated by the metaphor that he uses. That actually, when he's comparing the Buddhist and other philosophies to crocodile, the point is, it is to an informed audience who knows that they also are familiar with the Bhagavatam. And that indicates that the, so this outreach was primarily both of them were for largely for taking people from sattva to shuddha sattva. And in that sense, sattva is also considered to be a trap, so it's compared to a crocodile over here. And the last part was about class outreach. I talked about three things that is, appreciate their point of view, appreciate doesn't mean agree. But just say that it's reasonable that you come to this conclusion from your perspective. Then respect their position, that they are known to be subordinates because they are expert in their position. And give them time to arrive at conclusions. So if we do this, we can also expand our outreach to more influential and intellectual circles and follow in Mahaprabhu's footsteps in a small way in doing both class and mass outreach. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Do we have time for questions? Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, Till nine o'clock. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Prabhuji, for um, such a wonderful class, and. Um, I, I was thinking about this, about this uh, acronym to appreciate, respect, and give time, or allow time for the transformation to happen. And, uh, and I was thinking that, yes, sometimes we do come across very influential people whom we would like to present Krishna consciousness to. I was also thinking there are times as well that um, with our own family members, that perhaps we would, we're also wondering how do we present Krishna consciousness to them? And I was wondering if we could use the same system or is there something else that you would suggest to... Because uh, be, oftentimes, you know, they may say something and we think, no, this is wrong and we want to sort of correct them. But like you said, do we have that position to do so? So I was wondering if you could say something. Okay, yeah. So if we are to try to share Krishna Bhakti with our family members, how do we do that? 
Yeah, it's a, see we have our material relationship and it has its dynamics. And then we try to spiritualize the relationship that brings its own dynamics. So sometimes it becomes too dynamic. It becomes <laughs> that what is happening in that relationship, it's difficult to figure out. So uh, yes, these broad three principles can apply to any form of outreach, but let's put it this way. See if this is Krishna. In fact, I'll be doing a seminar on this topic eventually. But this one diagram is, this is Krishna, this is, say, this is V. And so this is our relative, our family member. So what happens is, say we could say this is one, this is our most important relationship with Krishna. Hmm? And this is two, our relationship with our family member. Uh, and the three is their relationship with Krishna. So the ideal situation is where all three grow together. So the Prabhupada said one of the purposes of ISKCON is that to bring everyone closer to each other and closer to the prime entity Krishna. That means one, two and three, all the three relationships grow together. That's the best. But among these, now when I put one, two, three, it's both in the, in the sense of importance and in the sense of control. Now we have the maximum control on our relationship with Krishna. And we have the least control on anyone else's relationship with Krishna. Now what happens is that the normal tendency of the, of the attached mind, now the mind can be attached to worldly things, the mind can be attached to even spiritual things and especially to try to, to give spirituality to others. So sometimes we get frustrated because we put in maximum effort where we have the least control. And we put least effort where we have maximum control. So we put too much time in three and we put a lot of time and very little in one. And so we are preaching to the other person, do this, don't do this. And they say, oh, you know, after you became a devotee, you know, you have become a more unpleasant person to be with. <laughs> so, is our devotion, we say bhakti, theoretically bhakti manifests, leads to the manifestation of all good qualities. But is that actually happening? So, in general, if the other person is not really very interested, or uh, they don't seem to be so eager, then it's best to see all these three as separate relationships. It means give time for one and, and do whatever is required for a healthy two. Means whatever is normal in that relationship, do that. And then leave three to Krishna. So leave three to Krishna because what happens is if we put too much pressure on three that you should connect with Krishna. Then what happens is that if we put too much say, pressure here then that creates a strain here. Because what is happening is, we are demand every, every relationship, there is a contribution that we are doing to the other person and there is expectation from the other person. So when we are expecting too much, on one side, you know, you should do this, you should not do this, we are expecting all that. And then when that person wants time, no, I have to go to temple for the program, I have to chant. So what happens is if our expectation increases and our contribution in the relationship decreases, then that creates a strain. And when there is a strain in a close relationship, then that actually creates weakness in this also. Because how much can you, if there is, there is this tension at the home, even if you sit down to chant, how much can you focus on Krishna? Can't really do that much. So, uh, what we want to chant to make our temple, our home into a temple. We don't want to chant as a means to mentally run away from our home. You know, my home is so much tension, I just want to forget it all. That's not the purpose of chanting. Mm -hmm. So what happens if that is happening, just decrease the pressure on three. Let that person grow at their pace. And do what is required in two. And make sure that we have our space for one. One is our relationship with Krishna. And in general, we'll find that, especially in today's world, which is relatively uh, not so hierarchical or so... Mm, Vertical. You know, if we don't inter, if we don't impose on the other person, the other person will also not impose on us. So if we don't force three, they won't interfere with one. So then, what will happen is we can pursue our relationship with Krishna, and then do what is required in our relationship with that person. And then, so as we keep doing that over a period of time, if we are practicing bhakti, that will lead to positive transformation within us. You know, we will we'll become more understanding, we'll become more tolerant, we'll become more helpful.
and when they see that then they'll feel hey this is uh, yeah this this bhakti this bhakti has made you a better person this bhakti has made you a better husband a better son a better pa- better parent a better sibling whatever it is then they'll say okay let me explore this bhakti also so in general for them it's very difficult to for to them to connect through us because our relationship dynamic comes in as a uh, as an additional factor so that's the broad answer okay thank you yes we have a lot of question yeah no. okay welcome to you Thank you very much for your teaching. Um, I'm a bit nervous about this question. <laughs> In I was going to ask you this last night. Um but your diagram there is quite pertinent to my concern. Because you Krishna you've got we or the followers and a relative that may not be attached to Krishna. Now my question is um if the relative uh, i'm doing this metaphorically if the relative is the buddha okay is and the buddha as far as i understand it did not um necessarily believe in a higher krishna but he did believe in what say technot han would call interbeing and the interrelationship of everything <clears throat> in the cosmos with um with ourselves and the idea that we do not have a separate self and that that also means that we're, f- we're full of non-self elements like the sun and the rain then in that context i would have thought the teaching of the buddha would be as high as anything else whether or not he believes in god so I, i i don't know whether i've made myself clear but um if i have a little bit then i would be very respectful and okay. like to hear your answer thank so you. let me paraphrase what i understood the question so what you're saying is that if if somebody is connected with a spiritual path where they don't accept krishna as a as a personal ultimate reality but they do talk about the ultimate interconnectedness of everything and they they don't they, there's no idea of the self but ultimately all of existence is, inter- is all of existence is interconnected so would that also be a high level of spiritual understanding is that the question broadly yes. yeah thank you so in general whenever we talk about any path see that path has many aspects to it so in the path there could be their philosophy hmm? then there could be their their culture hmm? mm-hmm. then there could be their social activities what do they do practically hmm? then uh, there could be other aspects you know, everything is so there could be there could be their personal relationships and so many things like that hmm? then there could be their practical resources their infrastructure or their environment they thoughts practically so when somebody is following a particular path you know what are they actually connecting with say for example somebody may say this person is a buddhist or this person is a mayavadi okay they they are a part member of this organization well maybe but is it that that philosophical element is what has primarily attracted them or is it you know they just like the like the environment over there they want their children to get something spiritual they want to have a place where they can have some calmness and peacefulness so there in so there could be many things which attract a person to a spiritual path so or a particular path and the teachings of that particular path may be only one element of that mm-hmm. so with respect to buddhism uh, specifically most people are attracted to buddhism uh, again i don't want to absolutize that's why i'm using most not all 
So most people are attracted mainly because of two things. One is the idea of non-violence and peacefulness. And the second is the idea of compassion and contribution. Most people don't really talk too much about the philosophy. Hmm? And the idea of, okay, everything being, uh, we are all interconnected, there is some kind of... Uh, some kind of ultimate union or something like that. That's, that's not the emphasis. That sounds nice, and that's fine, but that's not what mainly attracts most people. So my understanding would be that when we are trying to interact with a person, with anyone, rather than trying to just put a label, this person belongs to this path, this person is a Buddhist. Because even in Buddhism, there are so many different groups and there are different emphasis within the groups. Like, so like that, we'll focus on what is it that that person is finding attractive on that path. Mm -hmm. And we try to see how that connects with Krishna consciousness. So yes, in terms of philosophy, the idea that the whole universe is interconnected is, whole existence is interconnected, that is very much gels with the bhakti philosophy. That, uh, that everything is ultimately the energy of Krishna. In that sense, we are all interconnected. That is true. Now the idea of non-self, of, of the self not being there. Now in the, the, in, in the bhakti tradition or in general in the spiritual devotional traditions, see there is, there is the idea of the dissolution of the self and there is the absorption of the self. Hmm? And in one sense both are similar, in another sense they are extremely different. The dissolution is the idea that the self does not exist at all. That there will we'll come to a state where we will transcend the idea of the self. Hmm? But in absorption, we the idea is that we find such an attractive reality that we forget ourselves. And in the bhakti tradition, that is what is considered the perfection. So is it similar to non-self? Well, the self always exists, but the self, generally when we use the word self, it is associated with uh, fallibility, it's associated with limitations, it's associated with mortality, it is associated with, uh, with selfishness and other things. None of those are there in that state. So the idea of going beyond the self in terms of going beyond the limitations of the self, that is very much there. But that does not necessarily mean merging or losing our individuality, it means that losing ourselves in such a rich higher reality that our individuality no longer becomes a limitation or a, it does not have any negative effect on us. So if that is the understanding, then this idea of going beyond the self is also compatible with the broad Gita's understanding. Okay? Thank you. Yes, from. Um, uh, when you say the, the, the broader self and, uh, and acknowledging uh, the other person's beliefs and feelings, um, I, I can maybe, from my point of view, I remember Shruti Dharma Prabhu, who you could say was the epitome of this, actually. He was um, ultimately, he was a man for all seasons. He could associate with royalty, the poorest, uh, the the less intelligent, the most intelligent. Somehow, he had this capacity within him, empowered capacity, um, somehow to um, each person became a person individually. <laughs> Beautiful. And um, uh, th that's what I, I see as Shruti uh, Dharma, just as an example for those who didn't know him. Uh, you can see more about Shruti Dharma on the YouTube if you want to hear what this person is like and how he spoke to both royalty and the uh, pauper, you know. Um, so uh, that's yes. uh, so it's really just a statement. Thank you. In, in fact, this whole concept which I mentioned here, you know, this, this I developed in my discussion with Shruti Dharma Prabhu. He told me that here in the outreach, we generally separate the philosophy and the culture. That culturally we can connect with people, even if philosophically we are different. And then I started reading more about it. And I talked with Giriraj Maharaj about it. And then he told me that at one time this Dr. Mishra, the Mishra Yoga Studio in Prabhupada had met 
with whom Prabhupada had studied in New York. He came to meet Prabhupada later in the 1970s after his con had been established. And they had a very cordial talk, they had lunch together. And Prabhupada, then after Yuraj Mahal asked Prabhupada, Prabhupada thought he's a Mayavadi. And Prabhupada says, yes, he says, philosophically argue, we argue like anything, but culturally we are friends. So, this whole idea that people have different dimensions. And then we need to focus on the dimension that we can connect with them, not on the dimension that is different. So, in, in 1822, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna talks about knowledge in the mode of ignorance. It's a very striking concept. What it means is that normally knowledge is the opposite of ignorance. Normally, knowledge removes ignorance. But this is knowledge that reinforces ignorance. Now, how does this knowledge reinforce ignorance? Krishna says, we take one thing and make it into everything. So here, here one part is the philosophy. But what we do is, this is a person and this is their philosophy. But what we do is, we equate the entire person with just the philosophy. So philosophy is one part of the person. So that when, when we can find out that actually people have multiple dimensions and some dimensions may disagree. But some dimensions, there are a lot of similarities. So let's focus and work with those similarities. Then we will be, as you said, you know, treat people like persons. Yes, he's an exa excellent example. Thank you for mentioning that. Hare Krishna. Yes, true. Hare Krishna. Um, yeah. It's a question about the time. So like, let's say I'm talking to someone and I'm trying to help them. Like, I'm, I find it sometimes difficult to know how much time I should give. Sometimes it's months, sometimes it's more. Uh, and obviously I'm like limited with my compassion. I'm like, oh, they can just go to, <laughs> they can just go to Aloka. And, um, and I'm like, so how do I, how do we like kind of okay. make sure that we protect ourselves in relation to time, how much time it gives to someone who's trying, they're okay. making progress, but then just okay, good question. Actually, good you asked this question. Thank you. So how much time do we give to people? Actually, when we say give time, there are two different meanings over here. There is one is we give our time and the second is let them take their time. <laughs> so I was primarily referring to the second thing, not the first. If a person is not really interested in not reciprocating, then it's not that we have to spend days and hours and a lot of time on them. It is just that sometimes we open the door for Krishna uh, to somebody and if they don't walk in through the door, sometimes our tendency is slam the door in their face. Why did you come in? <laughs> no, we don't necessarily do that. Okay, we open the door and then we leave. If they want, they can come in at their time. So, yes, we have, we are, we have to be practical. How much time do we have especially? And there are different uh, forums. So if you are in book distribution and somebody starts talking a different philosophy, that's not the time to give time. That's the time, okay, just move on. But then if we are working with a colleague, if we have a relative, if we have a friend, or uh, some, some person who, with whom we have, we have a more of a uh, lasting relationship or we would like to have a lasting relationship, then in that time, situation we may have to, uh, we have to both give them our time sometimes, but also let them take their time to come to conclusions. So that way, we can uh, keep the door open. And when we spend time with them, it is not just to see whether, you know, how, what they are doing and how they are practicing Krishna consciousness. It is also Krishna consciousness has two different meanings, or many, but here in this context, two meanings. We could say is, or we, we are trying to interact in a Krishna conscious way with others. One could be, we could say, what that person is doing in relationship with Krishna. Hmm? Oh, this person is this person is not chanting. This person is not reading the Bhagavad Gita. This person is eating this kind of food and all this. This person is doing nothing in relationship with Krishna. Therefore, there is no Krishna consciousness in this relationship. Hmm? So, Krishna conscious vision of I mean, this is interpersonal interaction. When we are interacting with people, what does it mean? The other could be what Krishna is doing in this person's life. That means that although that person may not have a relationship with Krishna, Krishna has a relationship with that person. 
you know we may turn away from krishna but krishna never turns away from us so that means if that person is going through some experiences what is happening through those experiences now what how is that person's understanding evolving how is that person becoming wiser or just growing in life and everybody grows and evolves in life so if we see from that way then we'll see okay this person is moving from here to here maybe they're not yet they're still at a pre krishna conscious level but krishna is acting in everyone's life it is not like for krishna if you like iskon membership is not a lakshman rekha mm-hmm. krishna cannot go out of it <laughs> krishna is acting only in the life of those who are members of iskon no krishna is acting in everyone's life even in atheist lives mm-hmm. i once gave a class you know god does not believe in atheists <laughs> 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 you know, that person may be an atheist but god god sees us your atheism is just superficial that's a present misconception you are still my beloved precious part and i'm still acting in your life so that way in such situation we can we can see from that perspective and find out how to how we can what we can do in our relationship with them to help them on their journey okay thank you any of the ladies have any questions yes prabhu thank you for your stimulating class um it's sometimes said that when mahaprabhu preached to the masses it was harinam sankirtan to the the class it was vedanta sutras and the mayavadis the sanyasis and any relished rasa with his intimate associate from randa roy now it seems to me you're kind of maybe classifying it slightly differently and i'm curious to know why you are you saying that for ramana and roy that was outreach to the class as well as as relishing internally so yeah i'm just wondering okay good question yeah so we could say it was with ramana and roy was it actually outreach in the sense that he ramana and roy was already a devotee relishing high mellows of bhakti well yes we could say that it was not outreach in the technical sense that it is not that he is converting ramanand rai but still it is prior to that meeting at least in the manif- manifested leela mahaprabhu did not know ramanand rai ramanand rai did not know mahaprabhu it is sarom bhattacharya who told him go and meet him and at least in the as in the manifest narrative arc it was that meeting that was also such a meeting of minds that ramanand rai just decided to leave everything and come and be with mahaprabhu and he became an intimate associate so outreach doesn't have to necessarily mean that we have to change people's minds sometimes people may have similar minds but still they need to link with each other so that is also class class in the sense that he was already when i'm using the word class i'm saying it in more terms of he is already an evolved person and with that he is spending time and by that spending time Mm. so he was already a devotee ramanand rai but Mah- ramanand rai through this meeting became inspired to become a part of mahaprabhu's movement and he contributed to mahaprabhu's legacy okay thank you any last question so thank you very much sri chaitanya charitamrit ki shila prabhu pad ki gaur bhakt vrind ki tai gaur premanande